Right. Um, so the film we're talking about today, you can't really spoil it as such. I don't think. <laughs> Good luck trying to spoil it. <laughs> yeah, it's not really that kind of film, and it's also not really offensive as such, unless you're probably like a hardcore Christian type. Yeah, uh, yeah. Maybe. Um, but in case you are really, really, really offended by Christian satire and that kind of thing, and yeah, just be aware there may be discussion of a religious nature and there may be spoilers i guess but i guess i mean i could tell you what happens in it but i don't think it would spoil it <laughs> yes so the film we are discussing in a roundabout way is the holy mountain or to give yes. it its spanish title la montaña sagrada Ooh. um which is now this is quite interesting it's directed by alejandro Hodorowski, who mm-hmm. is the director of el topo and santa sangre and various more recent films as well but yes. not only did he direct it and write it and produce it um he also did some of the music some of the set design some of the costumes and he was in the film as the alchemist very busy so this is a proper, 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 like, auteurist project. Yeah, this is him, 100%. Definitely, definitely, 100% him. Um, Tom, yes. I'm going to give you the honour <laughs> oh. of somehow trying to summarise as best you can what the actual fuck happens in this film. Okay, without getting into any of the crazy shit... Oh, Greg, thanks for, <laughs> thanks for trying to maybe explain this. I think <laughs> it's all about... It's just about going on a spiritual journey. Um, and you have all these different characters, and they each represent something about, I guess, non-spiritual society. So there's the capitalist and, and the policeman and the, all these other people. They all go together on a spiritual journey. And basically, to me, it's a kind of fucking blitzkrieg of spiritualism. You, they throw everything in for these people to try. There's a lot of insane, surreal imagery. But in a nutshell, it's just about people going on a spiritual quest the ultimate goal of which is to conquer the holy mountain because quite a lot of different religious traditions have a holy mountain that you conquer. They're taken on this quest by a wise master, an alchemist. And then in a nutshell, they kind of, I I, I mean, I don't know if you want me to say what I think the more of the story is, but well, that's no, basically no, that's, what I think yeah. the story is. Okay. Yeah, because that kind of sort of, because this film, I, I kind of posed this question at the start and obviously I'm going to get back to this some point near the end. Mm-hmm. But, With a film like this, is it basically... I mean, we know people, I'm not going to mention any names. (laughs) But we know people. We know people (laughs) who, they're all about the story, and the story has to make sense. Yeah. And it's all about kind of like, okay, everything has to make sense, and everything has to follow a certain A very traditional Western linear... Yeah, linear story of telling, yes. This is very much not like that in the fucking slightest... In a weird way, in a weird way, it kind of is. I mean, it doesn't have, it doesn't like, for example, start at the end and go to the, go back to the beginning or start halfway through and then have flap, flap, flashbacks. Flapjacks. Flapjacks either. (laughs) Um, it has everything but flapjacks. Um, but I would say that there is, there is a central character, the kind of Jesus character, and you see his journey from essentially start to finish and he meets people on the way and he goes on a journey. So it has a linear story. It's just, it's just a lot of shit happens very quickly all the time that doesn't go well together. And that's what I think would confuse somebody who wants a traditional linear story. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the thing with surrealism is that, yeah, you just kind of have to just take it for what it is Mm -hmm. really and just accept it in its own internal logic. Yes. I guess it's the same with Lynch, although Lynch's films are a bit more rooted in the real world. Lynch has a kind of, more of a sort of yes it is surreal but it's it's more like because it's set in mundane in 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 the real life world or mundane settings that's what makes it difficult to swallow Mm. whereas Jodorowsky tends to favor the other end of the scale which is I'm going to be like hyper surreal I'm going to have lots of contrasting colors and symbolism and whereas Lynch is more like it's more like subconscious what Lynch does yeah I'd say Lynch is more dreamlike. This is, I mean, I've written in my notes for Mm -hmm. this. This is basically death by symbolism. Yes. Because uh, literally if we went through every single thing in the film that could be a symbol for something else, I think we'd be here for hours. Yeah, this is like a sort of Sinbad film, but (laughs) directed (laughs) by Salvador Dali. (laughs) Fucking hell. 
Yeah, yeah, I guess that is that is a good way of putting it. And I know yeah. it's a cliche to you, Salvador Dali, but it really is a sort of surrealism turned up to 11 mixed with mysticism just for the sake of it, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, well, <laughs> I mean, basically the, how it works from a storytelling structure is, mm-hmm. is basically there are three acts. So there's, yes, definitely. There's three sections. They're very distinct sections as well. So your first section revolves around a character who in the credits is called the thief, mm-hmm. but is basically Jesus. Yes. And then the second section is him meeting the alchemist. And then the sort of, it's like a, almost like an anthology film type stretch mm-hmm. from then on. It's like a, a tableau. I don't know if that's the right word to use, where you've got all these sort of eight other characters and they've got short stories kind of introducing yeah. them. And then they go on this spiritual quest where yeah. it's like they need to reach enlightenment. That's what I mean. It's a, it's a very traditional yeah. linear story. There is a there is a central character, the, the hero, as it were. He then g- puts together a, a fellowship of sorts, <laughs> and then they conquer a mountain. It's basic stuff when you stop yeah, and think like about Lord it. Of the Rings, yeah, guys. it's basically Lord of the Rings. Yeah, exactly. Okay. There's a hobbit that steals steals a ring. Yeah, I guess you I know. Guess, there's there's yeah. a fellowship. There's a mountain. Done. <laughs> yeah, there's short people in it. <laughs> sure, there's a lot. Yeah, yeah. there's everyone. Yeah, so one of uh, Hodorowsky's trademarks is people with no limbs. Yeah, I mean, this is something you you could talk all day about. He he definitely uses um, amputees and deformities as symbols for God knows what they symbolise half the time. But <coughs> but he is very fond of using them. Mm. Yeah, so I really really like this film it's as far as surreal films go i think this is definitely kind of one of my favorites and for this show kind of what i did was obviously we i mean for this show basically what we do is we watch the film and then we literally talk about it straight afterwards but what i had to do for a film like this is because it's frankly so fucking weird there's about (laughs) a million things going on in it i had to kind of watch it before Mm -hmm. as well and watching it a second time in such a short space of time it makes a lot more sense yeah of sorts i mean it ain't gonna make i I gotta be honest this whole anything to do with like metaphors and symbolism and this means this and blah blah blah, blah, i i'm not very good at things like that i'm just (laughs) gonna come out and say it straight away so a lot of the meanings are going to be lost on me but there's definitely, I mean, d- just look at the imagery. I mean, the imagery is so awesome that you kind of just get swept up in it, particularly in the middle section with the alchemist. I would say that um, a lot of stuff happens. I've seen this film quite a few times. Right. Um, okay. <laughs> and I do think that... It's like lot- your cannibal holocaust. Yeah, I mean, like the first time you watch it, you're just like, wow, this is batshit crazy. But the more you watch it, the more you're like, well, okay, that is pretty straightforward. He sees the alchemist. He turns his shit into gold. That's a pretty straightforward metaphor. <laughs> okay, he's Jesus, and then he, or earlier than that, he's Jesus. He wakes up in a room full of all these fake Jesuses, and he gets angry and smashes him. That's a sort of almost a reaction towards the commercialization of religion. All the metaphors, when you stop and, and view them individually, are really straightforward. Yeah, but it's just because there's so much of it. It's almost like a, it's almost like a super film. There's so much going on, and if you were to give each thing its fair dues. It would probably be like an eight hour film, but it isn't. It's everything condensed into short. So my problem watching it normally is you don't have time to process what you've just seen yeah. before your four metaphors down the road. And it yeah. happened. Everything happens so quickly that you, you know, and sometimes I think mm. it, I, th- I think he's almost like trolling. <laughs> okay. I don't know if this existed back it's like, then. No way. I think, yeah, I think this is almost like surrealist trolling. I think he knows he's doing way too much. And and I'm willing to bet some of the metaphors don't mean anything, and he just put them in there just 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 for fucking sake of it. It's always possible, yeah. Because <laughs> fr- frankly, like you said there's so many of them, so I'm mm-hmm. sure. It, I mean, have you seen uh, Hodorowsky's Dune, like the documentary? I have not. Or have no. you heard him speak? I have heard him speak about it, and I know people have seen the documentary. Because he's like, a yeah. fascinating guy. He's like, really intelligent. He's and like he's massively into tarots and all yeah, kinds of things. Yeah, he's on a completely different level from yeah. like the majority of people. So all this stuff really makes so much sense to him. Mm-hmm. Even little things like there'll be a quick flashing image which lasts like half a second, which yeah. appe- appears to seemingly have no meaning. That he'll be like, "Oh well, actually, blah 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 blah." That means this. 
But yeah, um, and no, I absolutely love it. I just love the way it looks and just what I like about it because it is very, very surreal. Mm -hmm. And what I would say to people who don't necessarily like surreal films, I probably recommend this one in a way because there's so much going on, you can't really get bored. Yeah. It's kind of what I'd say. I had this on once in the background with the sound off whilst we had people over and we were just playing board games and I just wanted something on in the background. <laughs> Nobody could concentrate on the game at all because not a second passes <laughs> where the screen is not like exploding with metaphors, actors, all kinds of things. So it is It is a good sort of introduction. I personally prefer his El, El Tupo that came before. Right. Because I think this film, I love this film, but it's very, it's it's like an all-you-can-eat banquet. There comes <laughs> a point where you're just exhausted. Um, whereas El Tupo has a nice balancing act and sometimes it's quite a bit and sometimes. This is just, as I said before, after the success of El Tupo, he was basically given a blank check to do whatever he wanted. And this is what happens when Jodorowsky can do whatever he wants with no creative or financial restraints. And I don't think he made another film straight away. No. I think, I think the student, nobody would touch him after this. They were like, no, you're way too crazy for us. You're, the world's not ready for you. Yeah. He tried to do June. Yeah. I think after this. And, you know, he had all these, for anyone who hasn't seen the documentary, it's great. I really do mm-hmm. recommend it. But essentially it boils down to he had all these crazy ideas which probably would have been absolutely awesome by the way mm. and it's a shame that the film never happened the way it did but then he makes it always possible now well <laughs> yeah exactly and then he went to this, uh, all these different studios and said do you want to finance my film and like well it looks awesome but no nah. <laughs> but no fucking no, way not, <laughs> not with you <laughs> no um which of the three sections did I'm asking which one's your favourite. It's probably a bit reductivist, but it's like, which okay. one do you get the most out of? Because it's hard to talk about this <clears> in terms of like a narrative structure, like a normal film. So you almost have to pick like your personal highlights for whatever reason. My, I, I, I would say the, the third, the, the third part, the first part is almost, is, is really the bit where there's just loads of weird shit happening almost for its own sake. And it's very mm. busy. Um, so that's that's kind of that's fun to watch. That's a real feast for the eyes, but it's not my favourite. The second bit is mainly when you're again introduced to each character and they have all yeah. their little mini stories. That's quite good and that's quite straightforward. You get okay, so the toy person doesn't want to do their job anymore because they're you know, why they don't want to do it. The policeman's got sick of all of the things. It's very self explanatory, all those individual characters. The real quest as such which is what the driving force of the film is really about. It's about the spiritual quest that all happens in the final, final third bit. Um, I, I said just before we started, my favorite scene is in that final bit, which is the Pantheon bar, which is a perfect, perfectly shot section, perfect metaphor for so many people. Greg, you must have bumped into these sorts of people <laughs> who think that they're really spiritually deep, but really they, they haven't gone beyond a very limited level of spiritualism. I they, know exactly who They you're think if they about. have a, ta- a couple of tattoos and, and uh, take some pills, they think that makes them a Buddhist or something. And the Pantheon Bar is just full of all these people who haven't quite made the journey. There's a very obvious Timothy Leary character <laughs> that always makes me chuckle. The guy who's <laughs> taken all the drugs and he's like, the Book of the Dead is a trip and the apocalypse is, is like a mushroom and the crucifix is... <laughs> he's hilarious. That guy who runs horizontally through the mountain yeah. and thinks that because he's won, sort of, that means he's conquered the mountain. A poetry guy. guy who just basically is t- talking, talking shit. shit. He's yeah. talking shit. Um, and you're just, it's so beautiful. That whole scene, in a way, makes up for any, up until that point, you might be saying this film's really pretentious. It's just weird shit for the sake of it. And then you watch that <laughs> scene, and that scene is almost making fun of anything you thought prior to that in terms of things being, it's like, yeah, yeah, I understand what you're saying about some people are just spiritual, talking. Just you know, gibberish. gibberish when it comes to spiritualism. nonsense. And that's what this scene is all about. It's all about like a wink to that. Yeah, because from what I read up very briefly, kind of before we recorded this, I think El Topo came out, made lots of money. Yeah. But there were people who, because of the movement that Hodorowsky was involved with at the time, there were people who just saw it as kind of like, well, this is not counterculture. This is in some way kind of hypocritical in Mm -hmm. some way. So I think there are bits in the Holy Mountain that are kind of deliberately poking fun at that, 
like yes. that section or like the section that is one of the um, little stories about one of the the other characters mm-hmm. uh, the one it's the second one where you're talking about how oh we need to arm people and it's all the different weapons so you've got the guitar the countercultural gun. yeah the, the, the students need something during their sittings yeah, and protests exactly. yeah i think that kind of stuff is deliberately meant to it is be a very, satirical yeah, as, a cynicism that. about the countercultural movement and how it hasn't a bit like something Hunter S. Thompson would do. Yeah. A cynicism about how counterculture hasn't really achieved its goals and has well, actually yeah. just stagnated a bit. Yeah, I mean, it's really hard for me to pick kind of which sections I kind of like the most. I agree with you about the first section. The first section is almost like, you know, it's overwhelming. Yeah. The first 25 minutes, that whole section, it's just literally one thing after another and it's just almost too much to take in. Mm-hmm. Um, so you've got, yeah, this Jesus figure and he's covered with flies and then he's being crucified and then he's not being crucified. And then there's this, you know, short person with, you know, no, one arm and no legs or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's all these soldiers everywhere. And then we said that's in the first two minutes I turned around here and went, this has been two minutes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's certain images that I liked. I did like the section with the toads and the chameleon that sort is of so war section. That is absurd. It's, it's so brilliant, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> which is just, how did he dress up all those chameleons? Like, that's, that's impossible. There's so many scenes. Well, like, there was that scene with the testicles and the glasses, and you're <laughs> like, somebody had to set that up for one shot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just so, so much of the production design. It's just so ornate. It's... um. In that, yeah, you're right. It's like someone had to literally hand put all that stuff together. (laughs) And like, just for what? Like a 30 second section of the film. It's like, right, right, pull this away now. We're finishing this. Now bring on, bring on the toads. We're ready for the next bit. (laughs) Yeah. Um, and there's the old guy who takes his eye out because it's a glass eye. (laughs) And I'm thinking like, what the fuck is this? And like, you know what? It's only, it's only now we're talking about it. Having just watched it, <laughs> that obviously, obviously, we we literally have just started talking about it as it's ended, and the final scene is brilliant in mm. that film because he talks, he basically breaks the film down, and he kind of goes, the alchemist is like, you know, we started off um, basically in fantasy yeah. or in a dream world, we then entered reality, but reality is itself not real, and then the camera pans away. Spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> but basically, that kind of makes sense when you watch the film. The f- as you say, the first third is. Just, what, what did you say? It's phantasmagorical. It's phantasmagorical. Just overwhelming. Overwhelming. Just that was weird. You said the first, the first third is overwhelming, and he kind of says that at the end. He's kind of like, yeah, the first bit is is you know, it's a dream. It's and then you go, oh yeah, he's basically telling you how he's made the film at the end. Yeah, I like the middle section as well a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, just the whole section of the thief kind of approaching the alchemist in these rainbow colored kind of hallway <laughs> yeah. with a fucking camel. And this dude on the throne with like two goats behind him. Two I think. goats, a woman covered in tattoos. Yeah, and just, just like... practically naked. And yeah, it's just, <coughs> I just love how that looks. And Hodorowsky, I, I need to rewatch his other films because I haven't watched them for a very long time, if I'm being honest. I don't know if this is a thing of his, but mm-hmm. I've noticed in this film anyway, there are a lot of really cool symmetrical shots. Yeah. So particularly from overhead. So particularly in those sections, there's a, a scene of, so they're washing the thief in this ornate white bath with yeah. a hippo in the bath <laughs> and all these white tiles on the wall. And it's just perfectly symmetrical. And then the next scene mm-hmm. is also shot from above this blue room. And it's again, perfectly symmetrical. Or there's a dinner scene in one of the shorter stories where mm-hmm. again, the dinner table is like ridiculously symmetrical and it's like all these people at this table and just yeah just things like that where you don't really get those kind of shots anymore because you can do most of it i suppose in cgi's this is like practical effects to like a ridiculous degree i think these are very unique to this film like Mm. my memory of his other films are that those kind of shots are very unique to this film it's like every everyone is living in a symbol of some kind every table and every chair is a symbol of some kind Mm. And like you said, like the main character, well, by, well Hodorowsky's character is yeah. an alchemist. Mm-hmm. And I suppose there must be a lot of alchemical, if that's even a word. Yeah. Um, sort of symbolism in there as well. Well, I don't know if it's the DVD, if it's this DVD that comes with the documentary, but I did watch one documentary where he's basically talking 
about within the context of this film um about tarot cards and alchemy yeah, it is this this one, yeah. yeah and the way he explains it it makes it it doesn't make the film make any more sense but it kind <laughs> of you understand why he's gone down that road because he's not just you know i said earlier it was kind of like is he just taking the piss sometimes mm. is he trolling it's kind of like well i think he might be to a degree but not as much as i initially thought before i watched that documentary i was like oh he really is into this kind of stuff he's yeah. really in, deep into this you know yeah, I, I got to be honest. I did start watching the tarot card documentary. He did lose me after a couple. <laughs> yeah, of minutes. he does go really deep yeah, into it. I'm like, yeah, this is way above me. Sorry, <laughs> I'm a mere mortal. Um, the first time I saw the film recently, I didn't like these middle sections with all the different characters. Yeah. It just they felt very short and kind of like insignificant. It stops but, the flow of the film. It damns yeah, the film. It kind of does. But this time around, when I watched it. I kind of got a lot more of what he's trying to do. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is very satirical in yeah. one way or another. It almost reminded me, I don't know if you agree with this or not, but a right. lot of it was very Brass Eye-esque. <laughs> so like the the woman who's like talking about, oh, um, wanting to collaborate with the government to invade Peru. Yeah. It's I like, told you that that's my favorite um mini story yeah yeah like that kind of thing or the section in the art gallery with like mm -hmm. all the ridiculous art like, the, the art factory yeah the art right factory. we're gonna manufacture some art today yeah like the, which i'm if, guessing is poking fun at andy warhol's factory probably, and, you know. yeah wouldn't surprise yeah. me um but yeah you've got obviously i mean if you've seen the trailer for this film which again doesn't really spoil the film because it's kind of impossible yeah, to spoil possible. in trailer for it. it's like here's a bunch of imagery it's like mm -hmm. it's fucking awesome um, but like the people putting paint on their asses and then sitting on canvases yeah. or the sex com like machine thing, <laughs> sex machine, <laughs> whatever that is, they just all felt very, very kind of Chris Morris. It did feel very tongue in cheek. Mm. Yeah, that's what I'm saying when I say like I feel like the film's almost taking the piss or trolling. It definitely has a sense of humor about it. Yeah, about it's itself and that. Yeah, yeah. And it's just, they all kind of have their own kind of unique look as well mm -hmm. to kind of distinguish themselves from each other. So it's not literally the same thing eight times. And also the, that middle sequence is probably the most straightforward and least surreal because you're basically going, okay, this guy is, is a policeman and this is why he doesn't like his job. This guy is the finance minister and yeah. this is why he doesn't like his life. This person makes toys and basically is training kids to kill. Peruvians. Yeah. yeah. And so you kind of go, <laughs> okay, I get why each one of these people doesn't want to be themselves anymore. They want to go and change their lives. I get that. You know, so it's the most straightforward part of the yeah. film in its satire. Well, they're all linked to planets and apparently like each one of their characters has the worst aspects of people who are born under that planet sign <laughs> or whatever. I don't yeah, know. that makes sense. Within That's the context of him and tarot cards and alchemy, he's going to know all that kind of stuff, isn't he? Yeah. Um, so that one, again, I kind of like that section for those <coughs> reasons. And then the third set part of the film is kind of the most straightforward because you're mm -hmm. not jumping around to different yeah. things. It's a lot more kind of straightforward because you're only following the same 10 characters. Mm -hmm. And it's about the spiritual awakening. It's a lot of stuff that I've seen in documentaries or TV shows where people go to these tribes and they have to drink like a green liquid that makes yeah, them trip and yeah. that kind of thing. So it just reminded me of that. And then they go to the bar. Pantheon bar. Pantheon bar that you said. And then they all start seeing really, really fucked up sort of stuff like literally in the last 10 minutes of the film. Yeah, on they the way have... to the mountain, they're told you will hallucinate things, yeah. ignore them or something. Yeah, and some of them, I'm just like, what the actual fuck is this? There is one moment where I was just like, I'm always like, you've got to be taking the piss. <laughs> and that's the old man with the, what was it, like tiger, well, yeah. tiger heads for tits? Yeah, <laughs> he had yeah, tiger heads for breasts, and he, he had different hair lengths on one half of his face and they're the spraying other. milk like super soakers, and he's just laughing his head off, and I'm just like... You what got, the hell are you doing at this stage in the film? You got cows fucking in one of them. A poor guy. A poor guy had loads of tarantulas all over his body. Yeah. I wouldn't have wanted to do that. Fuck that. And no way. What's brilliant is that at this point, we're like maybe, what, 10 minutes towards the end of the film? <laughs> and the film hasn't slowed down at no. any point. There is no we break time. There is no time you can chat to somebody. There's no time to like, you know process as i said there's no time to process what's happening you're 10 minutes towards the end and it's just here's some more high-powered crazy shit for you to try and process before we move on to the next one which is already happening <laughs> yeah so i mean 
I suppose just to sum up sort of my, my favorite individual shots of the film, because I guess, um, uh, there was one shot in, there's one of the stories, um, I said basically just reminded me of Mad Max. Yeah. Basically, it's about the guy, I think he's Uranus, I think possibly. He's or, the policeman, the head of the police. Yeah, or something. the head of the police cuts young boys' testicles off yeah. before they can go into battle. They have a battle of some sort. Which is very very weird, and at the end of that, scene, again, that's with street protesters. That's with the counterculture people yeah, who just get wiped out instantly, basically. And there's a shot right at the end of that sequence where there's all this smoke that billows across all the mm-hmm. people in like it's, it's like he's controlled this yeah. smoke. It's a really awesome shot. Um, it's yeah, just amazing. I have no idea how Hodorowsky did that, but there's that. Um, I say the scenes of the thief kind of walking up to the alchemist, mm-hmm. sort of in the rainbow colored. That's very stuff. good. That's all. That's awesome. very very good. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, the scene with uh, the thief when he's basically Jesus and he's surrounded by all these effigies of him, and then he goes yeah. into and there's just so many of them as well. Just the way that was done. Was there's just, just a lot in this awesome. film, as you've already said, but I'll say it again. There's so many things we're like. Wow, they had to make all those Jesuses yeah. for that one shot, and then they're all destroyed because they show them all destroyed. So, you're like, so imagine being the props guy in this film, <laughs> and every day you're just given a list of crazy crap, and you're just like, for goodness sake, crazy crap, love it. Um, so yeah, so a shout out really must go out to the cinematographer on this film because mm-hmm. it's absolutely wonderful and amazing. It's Raphael Corkidi, who was also the cinematographer on El Topo. Well, so not surprised. Yeah, yeah. so obviously, good partnership. Hodorowsky using the same kind of cinematographer two films in a row. It's really cool. Um, there isn't really a lot more really we can say about that because with a film like this, it's very very difficult to kind of talk about. Kind I have of a question. Incidents. I have a question for you. Oh, go on. Okay, and this, there's no right or wrong answer here. Um, so right at the end, right at the film, when a big big spoiler alert again. I know I've already <laughs> said this, but when he goes, you know spiritual quest etc etc you know what reality is not even real this is all a film camera draw back and it's like right now we can start the real spiritual quest Mm. so do you think and this isn't that basically he's saying at that point this whole film has been a big trick you know you know like i've been saying this whole time i've been saying he's he's trolling the audience or he's taking the piss at that end bit when he goes Okay, this is all just a movie. Camera pull back. Everything up until now has been just, you know, don't buy into all the smoke and mirrors of spiritualism. Spiritualism is an individual quest. You know, do your own thing. Because that's basically what I think he's saying at the end of that film. But what do you think? Well, I mean, again, I'm no good at this kind of stuff. So I'm just warning you now. But I mean, to me, it could be seen as something... I don't know if this came out afterwards mm-hmm. or around the same time, but like Monty Python and the Holy Grail, like the ending of that film, yeah. where it kind of tells you, right, you're in a film. Yeah. It's like, I know you've been watching a film, but now it's like breaking the fourth wall and mm-hmm. telling you, right, you're in a film. I think it might be that the whole film is like a metaphorical version of like the artistic process in some way. Like you're creating these. I'm probably talking absolute bollocks. No, go on, so go I apologize on. in advance. But like, um, the whole film is like, you're, you're creating these fantasies for people on screen and it's all an illusion when you watch it. And we've shown you all these things, all these wonderful, wonderful things. But now you have to leave the cinema and go out into reality and face that because that's the, the real world. And this is just an, an like I say, it's a fake world yeah. in a movie. I know that's kind of something along those lines. No, that's probably better than I put it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, if I was waffling like an absolute Cause, motherfucker. Because uh, another way I well. kind of look at it, or the way I combine different ways, because I've tried to come up with different ways of understanding this film, is that I feel almost like he, as somebody, as as I, as the documentary about him talking about tarot cards and stuff has shown, yeah. he's clearly a man who's looked at many different spirit, spiritualities and many, many different paths to achieve an enlightenment. And I feel like he's almost going through the film as a checklist of like, look, I tried this, I tried this, I tried this, I tried this. And in the end, when, you know, when they finally get to the, um, the, the top of the mountain, mountain and there's the, the nine immortals and it turns out that they're all fake as well. Yeah. I think, and then, and then he goes, right, now you have to do your own thing. I feel that that's him saying, look, I've tried lots of different things and most of it's going to be crap. <laughs> um, most of it is going to lead to nowhere. Most of it's going to lead to the Pantheon bar. Yeah. But. That's not to say that spiritual, spiritualism is nonsense. There is something out there for you, but you have to do it on your own. That's 
yeah something you could take from it or you know another thing i just thought of maybe again this could be complete bollocks but obviously it's his film he's a director mm-hmm. he's playing this character who's the alchemist yeah. he's kind of showing them the way so maybe it, the alchemist is just a version of him oh, definitely in yeah. a way um that's a very obvious way of reading yeah. it or whatever but again that could be something in it yeah I'm sure there are many millions of other kind of interpretations <laughs> out there of people who are far, far, far better at sort of this kind of thing than I am, <laughs> yeah. certainly, anyway. At least I feel that way. Um, so it's the time of the uh, the show where I'm going to ask you to rate this film out of five. So in terms of kind of your enjoyment of the film, kind of what did, what would you score this? I would score this as a four out okay. of five. Um, I think... Potentially, there could be room for improvement. Just tidying up a few, maybe loose ends. Um, maybe it'd be better off not doing that. If it was too tidy, I think it would lose some of its appeal. But um, I certainly feel because it's there's so much in there, it's just a little bit exhausting. Hence, not a full five out of five, but a very very high four point nine out of out of five. Yeah. Okay. Um. I mean, I probably would give this a five. I mean, in mm-hmm. terms of surrealism, I yeah. think it's very very difficult to kind of top this film. Um. I've seen Santa Sangre and El Topo, sort of his two other main yeah. films, and I'd say of the three, including this one, this one is probably my favourite. Although mm-hmm. I do like all three of them. Yeah, yeah. I think they're all awesome in their own way. Um, I just think with this one, it's just so visually pleasing mm-hmm. and it's just, there's just so much there to, like I said earlier, if you were not necessarily someone who had ever really seen a surreal experimental film before, this is a really good entry point for that because you've got all this stuff, but it is tied to an actual story and the story doesn't, even though what I say it's not really a properly, you know, free, you know, free out structure mm-hmm. with like characters and character motivations and all that kind of shit. There is still a story attached to it that you can follow yeah. as such, even if the, the first 30 minutes is quite overwhelming, as I said. Mm-hmm. Now, this is the interesting question, because we come to the, is it a good date movie or a bad date movie? So, from one to five, <laughs> how would you rate this as a date movie? I would rate this probably as a very high three. Okay. And my reason for that is, I reckon this is definitely a film you can discuss mm. afterwards. Like, yeah, I agree. Um, it just, just almost going back to your orig- one of your other points, but very much to do, is it a good date movie or not? Even if you don't understand it. Like, we're <laughs> sitting here pretending we know what we're talking about. God knows yeah. what this film's really about. Exactly. Um, but it's just, that's what makes it juicy. You don't have to be knowledgeable about surrealism or eastern philosophy to get to enjoy this film it's a real feast for the eyes i think it's a very enjoyable film and i think on a d- date depending on who you're dating yeah um, i true. reckon it would yeah i reckon it could go either way they could either walk away and this guy's nuts or this guy's pretentious <laughs> for putting this on um or they or they just, oh wow well, this, this guy's film, on drugs clearly. this film's really fucking interesting what's going on here what's going what's that about you know it's definitely something that um i would maybe I know we can't, I'm not going to do a three and a half. So I'll stick <laughs> Halves with... Halves aren't allowed. I'll three, stick with sorry. three. I'll stick with three. Okay. Um, I would say this is probably a two out of five. So I wouldn't say this is a flat out like, oh, you know, just Netflix and chill, mm-hmm. you know. Although, to be honest, this might actually work as a Netflix and chill movie because... Because it's so weird and there's so much going on, there is a possibility that the person you're with if they are likely to you know lose attention halfway through they could just get bored mm-hmm. possibly because there's so much going on and it's so overwhelming yeah. if you're not in the right frame of mind this could lose people quite heavily so you might be onto a winner with this one but it could also have the opposite effect as well where because it's so weird they might just think you're you know really pretentious or yeah they might just think you're you know on drugs you know, you're high as a kite or whatever. Um, but it's certainly not offensive. I think people would enjoy this film. Oh, yeah. I think it's a very enjoyable film to watch. Mm. And that's that's what gives me it sort of... That's what stops me from saying it's a bad date movie. I think you can... That's, that's why it has the potential to be just like the person. Even if they just end up laughing all the way through. <laughs> that's a good thing on a date, right? <laughs> you know, it's... Oh, yeah, exactly. Um, They wouldn't not enjoy themselves. There's certainly films out there that we're going to talk about on this show where by the end of it, they're just going to feel horrendously terrible. Mm. 
I mean, fuck, we did Cannibal Holocaust last yeah. time you were on the show. Yeah, Jesus. So <laughs> you'd certainly feel better watching this than you would do watching Cannibal Holocaust. Mm-hmm. That's for damn sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, so basically it might work as a date movie or it might not. You kind of have to gauge your audience, mm-hmm. I think is the, the short answer of this one. Cool. So if you like the sound of this film, got to be honest, it won't be to everyone's taste. And that's fine because everybody's right and everybody's wrong mm. after all. <laughs> um, so if you like the sound of this and you want to buy it on DVD, um, the version I own is from Tartan Films because we're in the UK, mm, in yep. the mean streets of South Croydon. Um, now, on DVDcompare.com, which is where I get a lot of this information from, it says that DVD is Region 2. However, the version that I have says it's Region 0. Mm-hmm. So if it is, in fact, Region 0, then it doesn't matter where in the world it is, you can buy it from the Tartan version. Um, if you're in America, Region 1, you can buy it from Anchor Bay on both DVD and Blu-ray. should say that the Tartan version is DVD only. Mm-hmm not actually available on blu-ray at the moment in the uk which is a bit surprising very surprising someone needs to get on that kind of right away give arrow a chance yeah no, but they'll be on that like a shot <laughs> i'm to- sure arrow will <laughs> yeah sort of thing they would do um if you're in this region and you want to buy it on blu-ray apparently the best version to buy is from alive which i'm not quite sure what country that is that might be austria or germany or one of those kind it's of like countries. one of those dodgy Knocking around eBay, kind of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, apparently, that's the best version, according to DVD Compare, if you want to buy it on Blu-ray currently, and you're in the UK. 